Uh, so, small correction before we get started. Uh, for some reason, I wrote down the name Moore instead of Moji uh, for one of the characters in this arc. I have no idea why I wrote it that way, but we went ahead and fixed it in post. Uh, I guess you'll see what I'm talking about when we get to it, but just wanted to put that note up front um, so people don't think I'm losing my mind. All right, back to the episode. Welcome to the Straw Hat Social Club, a One Piece recap show. Uh, I'm Todd, the One Piece expert, which is a made-up title that just means I've read the manga. Um, And I'm joined by someone who is completely new to One Piece, the lovely, the beautiful, the talented, the smart, it's Becca. How you doing? Hi. (laughs) How do you like that intro? That's a lot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, think we're, I guess we're I can't complain on it. about it. Sure. <laughs> um, but anyway, you're going to join us today as we travel to Orange Town, which covers episode four through eight of the One Piece anime and chapters eight through 21 of the manga. Um, so what are your expectations, I guess, going into this arc? Because we, we had a little tease last time with uh, the buggy, the pirate, his crew being introduced mm-hmm. and uh where were we? So they basically, they left Shelltown or Shellstown, whatever it is, and they are pursuing the map of the Grand Line. Um, so what do you, did you have any kind of expectations? What do you think? I think still at this point, there's not much to, yeah, yeah I'm not really expecting much because I'm still learning what's going on. Yeah, I guess we haven't gotten like fully into the swing of things yet. This yeah. is still kind of like the prologue of the series. Um, one thing I did want to bring up, I was looking into stuff dealing with how they edited the content, you know, for the TV show, because there have already been a couple little changes to things, one of which I'm going to get into in this episode. And what I actually discovered, so there was a, a company called Four Kids that acquired the rights to a lot of different anime like Pokemon and stuff back in like the early 2000s, I think basically got the rights to bring this stuff out in America. And we, I think we talked about this when we recorded the vampire hunter D episode that, uh, at that time still, you know, kids entertainment, kids cartoons were seen in a certain way in America where like more adult themes and stuff were not seen as being appropriate. So, It seems like for kids, it's almost like a dirty word in the community. Oh, really? Because when they acquired One Piece, they made huge changes to the content because they just had to make it as kid-friendly as possible. And it's like everything from the script, um, the content, they got rid of any kind of like Japanese lettering, you know, like everything they could. And it made it into like a completely different show, basically. So people seem like very not happy with it but i think they only got something like the first 130 episodes or something like that and then they actually gave up the rights and funimation took over and they redid the whole thing and made it more true to the source you know um so that was interesting i guess we missed that it was like a dark period in history for one piece fans probably um i will say one change i read about that takes place in this arc is that one of the pirates in Buggy's crew is like very, he's kind of like a black caricature. Oh. Um, maybe seen as kind of racist and four kids actually cleaned that up. But Funimation brought it back and I guess wanted to stick to the source. So maybe all the changes weren't necessarily bad, but I did think it was strange that they decided to keep that for the sake of, I guess, keeping it true to the source material. Yeah. A little weird, but I guess it is what it is. Um, I will say one thing that really stood out to me watching this again is this show, it really makes me feel like a kid again when I'm watching it. You know what I mean? Like there's almost like this nostalgia, because I think we talked about this last episode that even though I haven't seen any of this before, it just, 
it that era has like a certain feeling that's like very cozy and uh I don't know. It just, it really puts me in this really relaxed kind of state where I feel like a kid just watching cartoons again, you know, do you feel that at all? Yes. Yes. I definitely feel that. I think, I think we did touch on this before, but it does, it has a very warm feeling to it. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. So what do you think? You ready to get started? Yeah. Sorry. I had to take my socks off getting a little hot. (laughs) It would turn like the air and everything off to record. <laughs> um, they don't need to hear about my sweaty no. feet. Though. <laughs> so anyway, all right, let's get started. So this arc it opens with the proper introduction to Nami, our burglar from Romance Dawn as she's drifting through the ocean and she's not looking so great when she gets noticed by a passing ship that has a familiar Jolly Roger on it. Uh, so did you recognize that, the the flag on the ship coming up? I think I think so, because it was, wasn't there a preview of that? Yeah, it was on the, the note yeah. that she found in the safe. Yeah. So it's the, the clown pirates, which I'm sure you're very excited to meet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but they... Uh, they come up and Nami, she winds up offering these three buggy pirates her treasure in exchange for some water. Um, but it turns out to just be a ruse because she proceeds to steal their ship and all of their real treasure as they discover that her treasure box is empty. So how are you feeling? We're, we're getting introduced to Nami all over again. What were you thinking about this character? I mean, there's not much to go on yet. No, there's not much to go on, but it's pretty cool that she she can just trick these pirates into thinking, you know, they're going to take advantage of her, but she's using yeah. it to her advantage. She's our little burglar character. Yeah. Um, but meanwhile, while this is happening, we get a look at uh, Luffy and Zoro, who are just drifting through the ocean, lost and hungry and going nowhere, um, which I thought was pretty funny because it's basically like, They are in desperate need of a navigator. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that they have, like, so much energy, especially Luffy, um, but they have no idea what they're doing. Well, I think Luffy specifically, because I think there's parts where Zoro is kind of like, all right, let's go, like, you know what you're doing, right? You know, kind of thing, and is constantly (laughs) bewildered by how Luffy is just like, no, this is just how I've been doing it, just kind of drifting around. I mean, we did first meet him in a barrel. yeah. But it's it's just very clear he has no idea what he's doing and he's in desperate need of a crew. But I think that's that's one of the endearing things about his character is that it's clear like as strong as he is and as like determined as he is, he really needs help. Like he can't do everything himself. He can't really do anything himself <laughs> except get people to like him and f- want to follow him, you know. So... I don't really have anything else to say. That's why I'm just <laughs> so, going to let you do okay. your thing. And I, I don't have much else to say. So. That's okay. Just happy you're here. <laughs> um, yeah, honestly, I mean, that's the thing about this show is is I just love it so much. I love talking about it. So it's nice just having somebody to talk about <laughs> who isn't just bored. Um, but, yeah, as they're, as they're drifting around, Luffy's hat gets blown away by a breeze. I thought this was a nice touch because... You know, they frantically go to catch it, and Zoro is the one who winds up catching it. So it's pretty clear, like, right away, he understands the importance of his hat, even though, even as an audience, we don't really know yet why it's so important to him. No, but I like how he holds sentimental value in something. I think it's yeah. an interesting thing to include, because he could just be this, like, ruthless guy who does not give a shit mm. about anything. But I think you just see these so many different sides of Luffy. Yeah. And I think I I really love the whole straw hat thing. Yeah. Obviously. I we mean, named our podcast after it. Yeah. So. <laughs> but I mean, it's a great, it's a great like kind of anchor for his character that uh, it, it, it winds up saying a lot about, you know, how he treats sentimentality. And once we get into the backstory of the straw hat, um, well, why don't we get into that and then we could talk about this yeah. some more because I do think that's such an interesting part of his character. Um, 
So, I mean, after they recover his hat, that's winds up segueing us into a flashback of Luffy as a child where we get the explanation, um, of the origin of the straw hat. And we get introduced to Shanks, who is a red haired pirate who originally owned the straw hat. And he's the one who also inspired Luffy to become a pirate. One thing that was interesting to me about this, so in the manga, the Shanks backstory actually takes place in in the first chapter. Like it is how One Piece opens is with this this backstory. But for some reason they kind of moved it. I guess they didn't want to be too like top heavy with all this kind of story stuff in the anime, wanted yeah. to get us right into it. I feel like that's always a challenge when you're starting out with a series or something like this because you need to get people invested right away. So maybe they just thought it would be better to shift this further a little bit. Yeah, I guess so. And once you understand more about Luffy and the hat and everything, this is kind of a good opportunity to bring it up. Um, But also this whole Shank story is like almost one to one. I remember I told you about Romance Dawn, the like early version of One Piece that he made. So this Shank story is in version one of Romance Dawn and it's almost identical. Like even certain panels that are like iconic come from that. So he had a clear vision on this part of the story uh, from the get go. So Shanks and his crew, they are staying at Fusha Village, which is also called Windmill Village, um, where they're just kind of hanging out. I thought this was interesting because it's basically, even though they're pirates, this is kind of like a downtime where they're just like hanging out there and and not causing any trouble or anything until they are prepared to actually set sail for real. Um, and while they're there, they're constantly teasing Luffy who wants to be a pirate really bad. And, you know, it's very good natured. They're just kind of playing with him and telling him, you know, you're way too young. You're not ready for this. Um, but one thing that was interesting about this. So I remember you asked me a while ago about Luffy's uh, facial scar. Yes. And whether that was explained or anything. I, I honestly, I don't know how the anime is eventually going to handle this, but this is one of the big changes that was made for the sake of, I guess, censorship. Because in the first volume of the manga, when you get this backstory, what happens is Luffy takes a knife and he cuts his what face himself fuck? because he's kind of saying like, yeah, look how badass I am. Like, can I join your crew now? Like after doing it? And they're all just like, Luffy, like, what are you doing? No. So wait, is that... Are they going to... Uh, now I'm worried that this is like a spoiler if it's in the manga. It, I mean, I, the reason I bring it up because I'm trying to preserve any spoilers is because like, yeah, it's literally like the very beginning of volume one. He just cuts his face with the knife and it's I, it's pretty I obvious see, why they took yes. it out. Yeah, I can see why they didn't put that in the first chapter. So maybe now they're going to have to work it out. Yeah, I'm a, a little concerned that we might be spoiling I don't think so. I don't know if people who watch the anime end up reading the manga, you know, like in that order or, you know. I think it's okay. To me, it's okay because, like I said, it was a throwaway thing in the manga. There's not like some big story there. It's very quick. Um, And I don't know how the anime is going to handle it. But if they do wind up doing it a different way, then again, it's not exactly spoiling to say how the manga did it. Um, Okay. But I guess we'll see. Um, I kind of wish they would have included that. You know, yeah. I know obviously they were editing for children's show purposes. It's a bit much. <laughs> but it's yeah. pretty. It's pretty badass. I could see children seeing that and being like, "Well, yeah, yes. I want to do and that." And then also cutting the yes, okay, yeah, yeah. I mean, I I probably would have been one of those kids. Oh my God. Honestly, <laughs> that I was a little psychopath, so <laughs> I would have thought that's cool as shit. So I get it. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, while they're teasing him and everything, this is also when Luffy, he accidentally eats the gum gum fruit, which is just a treasure that the red hair pirates had been hanging on to. Um, and what's interesting there. So what it winds up showing is, you know, you look at the devil fruits and it's like, clearly that's pretty cool to eat something and have these powers. But in the one piece world, a lot of the pirates, they have n- no interest. They don't want to touch these things because it takes away your ability to swim. 
And the, the phrasing they use is they say it makes the sea your enemy. So you can imagine as a pirate how... That's the last thing you want. Yeah, a lot of <laughs> pirates would not be too keen to to lose the ability to swim and to know that if they fall overboard, like unless somebody rescues them, they're a goner. Yeah. Um, so that's why they were just kind of hanging on to it. And one of the small things that I thought was cool is they they call people who can't swim um, anchors in this. <laughs> so that turns into a whole thing where they call Luffy an anchor after he eats it because they're like, well, now you definitely can't join our crew because <laughs> you can't swim. But in the in the early Romance Dawn, there was some weird uh, terminology that didn't really make it over to the anime. Like they call it, um, they call them hammers which might have just been a translation thing with what I was reading, but I did think that was interesting. They kept calling him a hammer in Romance Dawn, but he's an anchor now. There was another one where they call people... Uh, so they they fully lay it out in the manga or in Romance Dawn, really, that there are certain types of pirates that are called peace mains that are basically pirates that target other pirates. And I thought this was funny because in, in the early Romance Dawn, like he straight up says, I want to be a peace main. I want to be a pirate that targets other pirates. But in the anime, it's more vague. And I actually, I like that better, that he's not outright like, yeah, I'm only going to target other pirates. He's just, it it has more to do with his characterization, you know, that his personality, that he's not interested in like picking on the little people, you know. So that is how they treated it in the manga? In, in In Romance Dawn, particularly, like the early version it does. I will say that it does seem against Luffy's character as it's being presented to me now. Yeah, I mean, he's way more like headstrong and just kind of follows his whims. Um, and I, I like that characterization better. You know, would you agree with that? Yes, I'll, yeah, one hundred percent. I agree with that. I, I think that it's a weird choice, to be honest. Yeah, but I thought that was interesting that it was so clearly laid out. And I think there was also another term that I didn't write down for pirates who are like bad guys, <laughs> you know, who like the other side of that coin, I guess. But I like it being more vague and it leaves more room for like nuance and stuff. But shortly after that, a group of mountain bandits, they enter the bar and they pick a fight with Shanks, which winds up being like a very iconic scene that says a lot about Luffy or Luffy's own development because basically they just start picking on him and I think they like splash beer on him and stuff and they just sit there and take it. Like Shanks, who is supposed to be this really revered, uh, well-known pirate, he just takes it and eventually they get tired and they leave and Shanks and his crew just laugh about it. You know, like, and I think at the time you kind of, get it like how did, how are you feeling about this like well i think that that's honestly the more honorable thing to do is to not be bothered yeah and to just let it slide rather than blow up and make it more of a big deal than it needs to be if we're speaking mm-hmm. in like real wor- world terms yeah i think ultimately you can see how this kind of shapes Luffy's character and how he views all this stuff. And there's there's a point much later where this comes back around, which we'll we'll talk about that more when it comes. But I thought that was uh that was very interesting. And I remember reading it, trying to like work through as I was reading it, like what are they trying to say about this? And it almost seems like it's like if there's so much more beneath shanks in them you know these bandits that it's like this is not worth our time why would we like pick on these guys you know what i mean like they they aren't a a real danger but in the moment luffy gets pretty upset and he questions like how he can call himself a man and everything which is also interesting um like he gets very angry about it and later on when shanks and his crew they go back to see the bandits actually return and luffy picks a fight with them because he's still like so fired up that they didn't do anything and after picking a fight these these mountain bandits who are like such tough guys which again shows the other side of this coin they are ready to kill luffy over this like this little child you know they're just like how dare you stand up to us and they're they're ready to kill him when shanks and his crew actually return and now with you know people's lives being at stake 
this is when they actually stand up and they they show you that gap in power because one of shank's crew members takes out all the bandits by himself you know just whips the shit out of them but the bandit leader after seeing that he realizes he's in trouble so he throws a smoke bomb and kidnaps luffy he takes him out to sea and he's actually just ready to kick him off the boat you know at that point which again drives home like now since luffy accidentally ate that gum gum fruit he once he gets kicked in the sea like he's a goner like he very quickly understands he can't swim at all he loses all his energy um but at that moment a sea king which are these gigantic sea monsters that live in the oceans of one piece it shows up and i think it basically eats the bandit and shank shows up in another iconic scene shanks rescues luffy and in the process he gets his arm bitten off and uh this was like it's a very emotional scene and after this is when you know shanks gives luffy his his hat and tells him you know return it to me once you made a name for yourself and you're a great pirate and i thought like what's what's interesting about this which ties back to how the the hat is so important. It shows that Luffy, even as a child, he understands that sacrifice that Shanks lost his arm just to save Luffy and is still totally positive and everything about it. I think this is like the first time that I like cried. Yeah. Which I know we've talked about that. I've already seen some episodes already past this. Yeah. Um, But this is definitely the first time I'm like crying. <laughs> it's an emotional scene. It's yeah. it's one of the like most iconic. It might be the most iconic scene in the whole series, I feel like. And that's still of him putting his hat on Luffy's head, you know. But it, it really does show you that like what that hat means to him, that it's part of it is, you know, it's a sign of how he needs to prove himself and and kind of gives him that motivation to pursue this big dream of his to become king of the pirates so that he can you know stand in front of shanks and you know say like look i've i did it like look how far i've come um but also it's like i said it's the recognition of that sacrifice that shanks made which i think is really cool and says a lot about luffy but back in the present after getting that flashback uh luffy and zora they notice a bird flying overhead and since they're starving luffy very quickly he uses gum gum powers to launch himself up into the sky to try and grab it uh but there's a kind of a little funny moment where th- he quickly realizes it's kind of an optical illusion and there's a gigantic bird that just snatches him out of the air and flies off with him so zora gets left behind and has to paddle after him but Zoro, he runs into those three pirates that were left behind by Nami. And very quickly, they realize they're no match for him because I think they try to take the boat from him. And all of a sudden, they're just like, oh, we'll, we'll show you to this island, no problem. And they, they paddle the boat for him. So this takes us over to the nearby island, which is where Buggy and his, his crew are staying. And on this island, Nami is being pursued by more pirates seems to be uh common with her and uh you find out that she stole the map of the grand line that they had taken but luffy he winds up getting dropped from this bird right on top of her and so now we are in orange town so after Luffy drops in, Nami, she tries to throw off her pursuers by saying that, oh, Luffy's her boss. And this, one, what I do think is cool about this is something that's common in the series. People tend to really underestimate Luffy because he is like so unassuming looking and kind of goofy, just some random kid. So these big, tough pirates immediately um, underestimate him and Luffy just clobbers the shit out of them. So after that, Nami's a little surprised and she takes him into a nearby house where he immediately just starts eating their food that's sitting out on the table. Do you remember that? (laughs) Yes. I thought that was funny. But as they're talking, um, Luffy discovers that she's a navigator. So he immediately is like, you have to join us. (laughs) You know, you have to. 
But once he reveals that they're pirates, um, Nami gets really upset and she makes it clear that she absolutely hates pirates. She will never be a pirate. Well, I mean, of course she would hate pirates. Like, well, we look at how she's being treated. Well, yeah. But we don't really get much of an explanation yet on no. like, why she hates them so much. Um, but she does tell him that she's trying to raise 100 million berries to buy a village, which is Luffy... It, is it berries or bellies? I'm pretty, we I'm keep pretty sure seeing, it's berry. Okay, because we keep seeing different translations. Yeah. So I didn't know. Maybe we could look into that. I'm curious about that because I've, I've yeah. known it as bellies with some of the translations. Yeah, then, I, I'm pretty sure it's berries. I guess we could look into this between now and the next episode. And I think they're like coins, but I think it has to do with the pronunciation. Mm. gets kind of confusing, but I'm, I'm pretty positive it's berry. But one thing that was interesting here is in the manga, it makes it very clear that Nami's whole thing is she only robs pirates. like And, and that ties into her character and her hatred of pirates. But in the anime, she kind of just robs everybody. <laughs> you know, like whoever has money, like she'll she'll take it from. Yeah, wait, we opened up with her on that cruise ship, so mm-hmm. she's just eating the rich. <laughs> well, I told you, yeah, all, Nami wasn't present in the manga during all of that, so right. they just, I guess, they really wanted to introduce her early. But yeah, I mean, obviously, she doesn't care too much about Luffy when she finds out he's a pirate, so she comes up with a plan to tie him up and pretend to hand him over to Buggy and the pirates um, in order to kind of clear her name and pretend to join them so that maybe she'll get an opportunity to clean them out of everything else. Um, and that's exactly what she does. She she takes him over to Buggy and they put him in a cage and Buggy says that, you know, if she wants to join, she's going to have to kill him, uh, which leads to a pretty tense scene because then um this is when she nami reveals that the reason that she hates the pirates what should reason why she hates all pirates is because a pirate killed someone that was very close to her but even having said that she just she can't bring herself to kill luffy in cold blood like that you know so it turns into this whole scene where they they load up a cannon with something called a buggy ball which are like these giant cannonballs that are super destructive another pirate lights the fuse and nami becomes so kind of overcome with guilt i guess over this that she uses her own hands to squeeze the fuse and burn herself just to try and put it out but this kind of gives the game away buggy sends his pirates after her and zoro winds up finally arriving and saving her life um and then he winds up, he has to actually challenge Buggy in a fight. Uh, one thing I, that we did kind of skip over that I just wanted to point out real quick because I thought it was funny is that we get a little reveal when Zora, I think it's when Zora is with Luffy, he, he talks about how like basically he left his village a while ago and he just got lost and couldn't find his way back. So then he decides, oh, I'm going to make the mess of it and just become a bounty hunter. And it's just funny that like from the get go, he's just like instantly gets lost and then decides, eh, all right, I'll be a bounty hunter. So he, he wasn't exactly tied to that job. What's, what's so funny about that is that I feel like I know people in real life that that would just happen yeah, to. Just stumble into stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so when when Zoro starts fighting um, Buggy, I mean, immediately he just chops them like into three pieces, which I thought was like pretty crazy. Because if <laughs> if we didn't get the reveal that, which we'll get to about Buggy's devil fruit powers, it's like, yeah, he just chopped the shit out of that guy. Like he just murdered him. Like, and, like we don't really see too much of that. And he didn't even blink an eye about it, you know? But after getting chopped into pieces, everyone is kind of just like nonplussed, like nobody really reacts. And next thing you know, Zora is getting stabbed in the back by a floating hand with a knife in it. And this is how we get introduced to the second of many devil fruits in the series, the chop chop fruit, which is Buggy's um, secret power. So at this point, we've been introduced to the gum gum fruit and the chop chop fruit. What did you think about this, uh, this new devil fruit? Well, I remember when we first saw it, 
I was a little like shocked. <laughs> yeah. Because I was I was not I was like okay this guy's dead. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the fact that he just has body parts floating around that's a very cool way to show like a superhuman yeah. power. It's a it's a weird one. I and I like that how you think with your average person coming up with this stuff, you can see all the like obvious kind of powers you'd create. But the fact that the first two we get are like a dude made of rubber and a guy who can literally like cut his own body into all these little pieces. It's like just so weird and so inventive. And I really like that. Um, but yeah, so that's what we get made clear is the chop chop fruit basically means he can separate his body into little pieces. He's immune to being cut. And uh, this makes him an obvious problem for someone like Zoro who uses swords. But at this point, Zoro has been stabbed in the stomach. So after he's being after he's been injured, Luffy just tells him to run because um, he's got to look out for his crew. And it's clear like he's not going to be able to do anything here. So Zoro, he winds up turning that cannon on Buggy and his crew and he grabs Luffy's whole cage and runs off with it. <laughs> well, funny about that. <laughs> it's it's such an insane thing that he has that much power and oh, strength. Yeah. To just, it just makes me laugh. It is a first introduction. They're like Zoro. He's a tough motherfucker. <laughs> like no question. Yeah. yeah. But Nami notices that too. She gets pretty impressed that he would do all this for Luffy, even while he's um, injured. And I think we get a lot of these little moments that you know Luffy or Nami. Her first impression of Luffy is like, fuck this guy, he's a pirate. But we get these little moments where you can see she's noticing like there's something more to him. And this this loyalty that he's already inspired in Zoro is, is part of it. So she winds up sticking with them. Yeah, as they as they get away, Buggy winds up sending Moji. the Beast Tamer, one of his top crewmates after them. So after they, they run off, Luffy, Luffy, Nami and Zoro, they meet. Chow Chow, mm -hmm. little dog. He's this tiny little dog who who hasn't evacuated the village with everybody else because um, it's kind of a ghost town. Everybody evacuated once Buggy and his pirates showed up. As they're they're wondering like what's going on with this dog here, this is when the mayor shows up, and the mayor explains that this dog's master. He was the owner of the pet shop in the town, which he regarded as like his most valuable treasure. But three months ago, uh, the owner became ill. And he, when he left to see a doctor, he told Chow Chow to watch after the pet shop. You know, that was like his last thing that he said to him. And he never comes home because he winds up dying. And there's this really touching moment because you can see Chow Chow. He was so loyal to his master that he stays behind and guards it, even though the mayor says like he's pretty sure he knows that his owner's dead. So the mayor's been making sure to feed him and look after him. So what do you think about this? I thought this was a nice, sweet little story, you know? Yeah, I I really liked this. I mean, first of all, I'm just going to touch on, is it Choo Choo or Chow Chow? Choo -choo. One of them, I don't Choo -choo. know. Choo Choo's voice actor is yeah, like... Yeah, we were going to talk about that. No, let's, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> the first time this dog barks, I'm like, it's a human. It is that is a human. Yeah. But you know what? I can't even critique it in a bad way because it's still it just I, they're good at picking voice actors yeah. for this. But it's just so funny. Yeah. That you hear this human going. Bark, yeah. bark. <laughs> I think it's it's funny. It still works, but it's funny again coming from the manga. And it's like oh, such a touching scene. Had me like tearing up and stuff. And then in the anime. <laughs> It's a little dog like, meow, 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 like a person just <laughs> seem to kind of get over that for a moment. But I will say that did break the tension funny. there for how emotional. Yeah, it's it's still it's sweet. <laughs> um, but, you know, after, after this little introduction, Nami, she reveals that she actually stole the key to Luffy's cage. But Chow Chow just eats it because, of course, can't be that easy, you know, but uh Zoro, he goes off to the mayor's house to sleep off his injury, and this is just in time for Moji, the beast tamer, to show up with his uh, gigantic lion with purple hair. <laughs> which okay, um, he shows up at the at the shop after 
uh, they've gone off and his lion, I mean, in one blow, it, it destroys Luffy's cage and sends him flying through a building. So the mayor and Nami just think, oh, he's done for. And they just run away. Um, so, so one thing I thought was cool is in one piece, I mean, obviously they can't just have all these pirate crews that all look the same and just look like regular pirates. So he goes all in on giving each crew a very distinct identity so in this case with buggy being this clown his whole crew is like circus themed and i thought that was cool that's like of course it's like the animal tamer is one of them and he's such a funny design because he has like his hair shaped in like the little ears mm-hmm. like little dog ears or something and he has like little fur armor <laughs> <Yeah>. sort of <laughs> very funny little design but um but then we get another touching little scene because after he launches Luffy out of the way, uh, he turns on Chow Chow guarding the shop and the lion winds up fighting Chow Chow, but Chow Chow like will not back down. Like he's got to defend his owner's shop. And this turns into a, a pretty sad scene because they, they steal the pet food from the shop and they burn it down and you get that little scene of Chow Chow barking at the burning building with little tears coming out of his doggy eyes. Yeah, it's like it was very, very sad. sad. Yeah, but after this, um, Luffy he he comes back because of course he's completely unharmed and just <laughs> I feel like nothing happened. But he he sees what happened, and again, you know, this is um, very telling for his character. After seeing this, he goes after Moji and he just annihilates that lion. He does, I don't know if you remember, it's like this gum gum gavel where he twists his arms up and grabs him and then slams him into the ground. Um, and it becomes clear that Moji isn't maybe much of a fighter, maybe kind of dependent on the lion. So he just gets <laughs> blasted out of there. Um, but after this, Nami and the mayor, they come back to check up on Chow Chow. Um, and this is when Luffy returns with a little broken box of pet food and gives it to him. And you can see right away made this little bond. And this is after, you know, his first introduction, Chow Chow's like biting him in the face and stuff, you know? Yeah. And then there's also like Nami notices. Yes. And I thought that that was nice too, because she was like, oh, that's why you did that. Yeah. It's another one of those little moments where Nami, she notices that there's something more to this guy. And it's another glimpse at, you know, we're building this this idea of what Luffy's morals are like and what drives him. And you can see that he just doesn't like it when people pick on the little guys mm-hmm. and he's not afraid to stand up to people. But in this in this really heartfelt moment, the mayor reveals that the town itself is basically his treasure. You know, he gives this whole backstory about them showing up there. I think their previous town got destroyed by pirates. So they found this island and they built this town from scratch. And then uh, Buggy and his crew come along and destroy it. And so the mayor gets so angry and kind of inspired by Luffy standing up against them that he's like, you know what, I have to man up and I have to go confront Buggy myself, even if he can't really do anything. And when he goes off, it's another cool moment because Nami, she just she can't believe that Luffy and Zoro are just going to let him go off by himself because they just do. But then right after that, um, it, it becomes clear like they let him go because they're just they're impressed. They're impressed by his determination and they don't want to step in his way. But they also immediately say like they immediately go off after him. And when Nami's like, what are you doing? They're like, well, we're going to help, of course, you know, and that's another little moment that Nami realizes um, that she recognizes and. She agrees to team up with them, not join them, mm-hmm. but she'll she'll team up just to see like what's going on. Because Nami herself, even though she's not like super strong physically, you can see she kind of lines up with them in that like she doesn't like watching people get stepped on. So yeah, Nami, she agrees to team up and she goes after them. It's feeling good, but this is very short lived because when uh when the American fronts Buggy, Buggy sends his hand out and starts choking him and Luffy has to jump in and save him. But right after that, in this nice touching moment, 
Uh, Luffy just like shoves him into a pole and like knocks him out like very violently. And Nami's like, what are you doing? <laughs> but Zori, Zoro, he immediately sees like, oh, uh, yeah, he's just going to get in the way. And, you know, and they realize he's just going to get hurt. He had his moment, you know, where he came and stood up to them. But now Luffy and Zoro are going to take over. So Luffy immediately, he calls out Buggy's giant red nose, which seems to be a uh, sore spot for him. And so Buggy, he gets so angry that he fires a Buggy ball right at them. And again, we see a moment where we get a glimpse at Luffy's gum gum powers because he's able to just inflate his whole body and deflect the cannonball right back at them. That's such a silly thing, too. Yeah. I love I love all of the silly, like, superpowers that you keep coming across so far. Yeah. Um, but after that, you know, obviously that would be a little too easy. And we see that Buggy and another one of his top crew members named Kabaji, they use the other crewmates as human shields to block the blow. And... This is when Kabaji comes out and decides he's going to take on Luffy. So he runs in there to attack him, and Zoro has to intervene because this guy, he's a swordsman like Zoro. Um, so the, the things that I want to talk about here, well, first of all, I wanted to quickly say this is a little change, but it was one that was kind of disappointing because in the, in the manga, you know, with this crew being all circus-themed, the whole thing is that Kabaji is... Um, what do you call it? He's like an acrobat, you know, that's like his role. And when he's introduced, he pulls his sword out of his throat, like a sword swallower, <laughs> which I thought was just such a cool little creative touch. No, you know? I think that's the only way you should store your sword. Yeah. I mean, that's just so, <laughs> it's such an awesome thing. That's like, like every little thing he does is like an acrobat. Like he's on the little <laughs> unicycle, you yeah. know, and everything, but they took that out of the anime. Um, whatever. But, um, but it also makes it clear in the One Piece world, being a swordsman is kind of like a distinct role in most of these pirate crews. And it's it's a weird thing where it's almost like you need a swordsman so you can fight the other swordsman. Because if you don't have a swordsman of your own, you know, having a sword, it's a pretty deadly weapon. Like you could yeah. just dice everybody up if they're unarmed. So it makes it clear like this is kind of Zoro's role. Um, and part of him wanting to be the best swordsman in the world is like he needs to take on these other swordsmen and prove that he's the best. Like he can't lose. He has to beat every single one. Um, but Kabaji, he immediately targets Zora's wound and just keeps hitting it over Which and over. Is such a bitch move. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a bad guy thing to do, you know, just kind of how it goes. But. Again, what's interesting, and this is another little change, is that after it's clear he's just going to keep targeting it, Zora just lets him cut it. So there's a point where Kabaji charges him, and he just lets him cut his wound and is basically just like, you know, if I can't beat you even with this wound, then I'm not going to get anywhere, you know. But what's cool is in the manga... He actually takes a sword and he cuts himself with his own sword to be like, because he sees he's targeting it and it's basically like, oh, this, <laughs> like no big deal, you know, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. But you can see those are the kind of things that anime is like, maybe not, <laughs> maybe no, not. That's almost insane. Yeah. The, when it comes to cutting yourself, uh, this seems to be a theme that you're yeah. letting me in on the yeah. manga, which is insane. <clears throat> and this change wasn't wasn't terrible. I like both. But the idea that he lets him cut him, I think that was a good way to change it, you know. I think either way still shows the same amount of character. Yeah. Like it's a smart way to change it. It is. Um but yeah, after that, Kabaji he attempts a big flashy acrobatic attack as he launches himself high into the air to drop down on him sword first. And Buggy, when he sees this, he launches his hand out to grab Zoro and hold him in place. And Luffy is just like, uh-uh. Like, <laughs> you're not getting in the way of this one-on-one -on -one duel. So he just steps on his hand as it's flying over, which also is a cool moment for both of them that you can see Luffy, he, he trusts Zoro completely. And he has this kind of respect for the idea of like 
two people having a one-on-one -on -one duel and like you shouldn't interfere with that um and nami meanwhile though she's just like what in the world is going on here so she just she just sneaks off and decides she's going to use this opportunity to steal buggy's treasure which by the way another one i know i'm talking a lot about comparisons to the manga well, but that's why we're here sure but <laughs> I don't know if you remember this scene where she's stealing treasure and a pirate comes up and she like kind of shows her boobs to distract them. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? Yeah. That whole scene is not in the manga. I mean, of course it's not, which cr is crazy. But that's a weird thing to add. It is if you're aiming towards a kid's audience. Yeah. I will say that is a weird thing to add. It is weird when you look at how they change like these certain violence things. But then it's like, oh, but we need more Nami's titties. <laughs> like, that's OK. We need more of those. But when we get back to the fight, we get to see that Zoro is definitely not all talk and he's earned this dangerous reputation he has because he defeats Kabaji with a single attack. His signature attack, which is the first time we're seeing it, the Onigiri. But as soon as he does that, he just passes out. and He's kind of like, I'm going to sleep. And Luffy's like, okay, I'll take <laughs> over. Which, again, that's cool because it shows like he's tough as hell like this whole time he's like bleeding out and he fights this guy but afterwards it's clear like he's not okay like he is still hurt and exhausted and just like i'm good now time to sleep so finally with the rest of the crew defeated we now have Luffy challenging Buggy to a duel for the final confrontation in the Orange Town arc. Music cue. Oh, okay. <laughs> so once Luffy confronts Buggy, it's immediately clear that both of them dream of being King of the Pirates, which this is kind of the idea in this whole golden era, this great age of pirates is that Everyone was inspired by Captain Roger, which we'll get to that story later. But there are all these different pirate crews that all have the same aspirations. They all want to be the best. They all want to get famous and they want to be the next king of the pirates. Um, but it means, you know, to get there, you're going to have a lot of these confrontations where you have to prove yourself and kind of work your way up the ladder to make a name for yourself, you know. And we can see that... This is Luffy's first real confrontation, you know, his first time running up against someone with devil fruit powers because Captain Morgan and Alveda, they were just r tiny roadblocks. You know, this is kind of set up as his first real fight. But before they get into it, Buggy, he recognizes Luffy's straw hat, which seems to only make him angrier. So he launches all these attacks targeting the hat and, and, it really starts because he he launches an attack that cuts Luffy's face and also cuts his hat, and Luffy gets pissed. And at first, Buggy thinks it's because he cut his face, but then it's clear, no, it's because he nicked his hat. And after that, Buggy just starts targeting the hat and winds up doing a bunch of damage to it. But now, Nami has returned, and she also notices how important that the hat is to Luffy. I think this is the first time when she sees that Luffy regards his hat as his treasure. As they're going back and forth, it Luffy Luffy winds up making it he reveals that that this hat actually belong, belonged to Shanks originally. And Buggy when he hears that, he only gets more angry and starts speaking badly about Shanks, which makes Luffy more angry and Luffy charges him and hits him right in the chest. Then we get introduced to another flashback where Buggy makes it clear that Shanks is the one man he cannot forgive. So years ago, Buggy and Shanks, they were actually crewmates on Captain Rogers' ship. Did you pick up on this watching it? Yeah. I Well, immediately when they showed the flashback, it made sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't sure if it got that across. I did think it was weird cuz uh they're in the beginning of the flashback they're getting yelled at by this pirate named Rayleigh, Ray Ray I'm not even going to try. <laughs> I think it's Rayleigh. Riley? No. Maybe, but what was weird is that he actually looks completely different than he does in the manga and I think that 
the animators were kind of like, eh, he's just some random dude, not realizing that like he's going to come back as a major character way later, which don't need to say anything else about that. But it was just an interesting detail. Um, but at some point, they attack another pirate ship. And in the process, Buggy actually gets his hand on a treasure map, which he decides to secretly keep for himself because he thinks that he can use this to fund his own pirate crew. And that night, as they're celebrating this victory, he winds up sharing these aspirations with Shanks. And they both make it clear they both want to be famous p- pirates in their own right and have their own crews, which means they'll probably wind up fighting each other eventually. But it, it's in this universe, people have these huge dreams and ambitions, and you know they don't care about what it's going to take, what's going to get in their way. Like Luffy's not the only one who has these big ambitions, which is is an interesting part of One Piece. I think it's an interesting way to show how a friendship can sour. Yeah, that's you know. But it is interesting because even with Shanks, you know, when he gives his hat to Luffy, I think there is an implication that when they do run into each other again, they're probably going to fight because Shanks wants to be king of the pirates too, you know, and there can only be you one king. I don't you think never I, think about I that? never thought about that. I think that's the idea. That's insane having to fight your role model but that does seem like a very oda thing to do i mean it's it's definitely it speaks a lot to the idea of having a dream that's so big that you can't let anything get in your way like you can't flinch away from anything to make it happen yeah but during the scene shanks also reveals that they found the devil fruit on the enemy pirate ship and once again it's revealed that like you know, even though it's this great treasure that gives you these powers, nobody wants to touch it because they don't want to lose that ability to swim. He does mention that this thing could be worth up to like a hundred million berry. Like that's how valuable that these devil fruits are. And that's the thing that makes Buggy's eyes light up because he figures if he can get his hands on that devil fruit and this treasure map, he's got it set. So what he winds up doing is in front of the whole crew, he actually pulls out a fake devil fruit. I have no idea the logistics of this, that he has a fake devil fruit that looks identical that he eats. Maybe there's like a secret black market for these things. I don't know, I guess. It's kind of strange, but he eats it in front of the crew. And because they basically say, even though it's worth all this money, anyone who wants to eat it can. It's just nobody wants to. So when Buggy volunteers, they're all like, all right, whatever, man, do you. (laughs) Um, But later he goes off by himself and reveals he's got the treasure map. He's got the real fruit. This is his whole plan. And this is when Shanks winds up surprising him. And through a funny series of events, he winds up, Buggy winds up accidentally eating the real devil fruit and also loses the treasure map. It flies off into the sea and he just immediately jumps after it before realizing like, oh shit, <laughs> like I can't swim. And Shanks has to actually jump in after him and Yeah, it's save a good him. thing he faked them out because he thought he already knew, Shanks already knew he couldn't swim. So yeah. it's a good thing. But it's interesting because yeah, after that, um, Buggy, he blames Shanks for turning him into a chop chop man. And that's why he says he could never forgive him after that. Even though it is completely 100% his fault. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the idea, yeah. Uh, but anyway, so back in the present, um, Buggy, he notices Nami trying to run off with his treasure. And this seems to be a big part of his character. Obviously, especially after that flashback, we see Buggy cares very much about money. He, he seems kind of in line with Nami on that. Um, so even in the middle of his fight, he prioritizes going after Nami to get his treasure back. So he flies off after her with his upper half and Luffy, who who has very different aspirations, is just like, what are you doing? Like we're fighting. So he sees his leg sitting there and walks over and just kicks him right in the nuts, (laughs) which is also funny. I mean, this is one of those things that kids are probably cracking the fuck up because I mean, I was cracking the fuck up. But the way that Buggy's like on the ground just going, my balls. It's like very on the nose. It's like (laughs) definitely. There's no mistake. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's definitely the kind of thing, you know, kids would just be laughing at. He said balls. (laughs) Um, 
But Buggy responds to this by using his Chop Chop Festival, which makes his whole body separate into all these little pieces, makes him a little bit hard to fight. But even in the face of that, Luffy notices his feet are still on the ground walking. (laughs) So as he's trying to still go after Nami, Luffy just goes over and grabs his foot. I thought this was really funny because he just casually takes the shoe off, starts tickling it, and then just (laughs) slams the toes into the ground. It's just like, God (laughs) damn, that was to hurt so bad. But the cool thing about this, though, is it shows how Oda puts a lot of thought into these concepts and ideas and so the idea that devil fruits don't have like this unlimited power like there's always kind of restrictions and things that like ground it in reality and the whole thing with the chop chop fruit is like his feet have to be on the ground at all times he can't just have because otherwise he could just fly into the atmosphere you know with all his whole body so it's like he's still restricted by keeping his feet on the ground um But Buggy, I mean, even after all this, he refuses to let the treasure go. So Luffy has to intervene and take the attention away from Nami because he's still just like, hey, we're fighting. Like, what are you doing? And during this moment, uh, Nami actually gathers up his body parts and ties them into a a bundle. So when Buggy tries to reassemble, we get that comical little like head with yeah. his hands and feet it's attached so to it. It's so funny. Yeah, it's pretty it's a funny way and to deal with him that Nami and Luffy had to team up and it's a pretty smart way to counter his ability. And so And it's such a nonviolent way. Of, true. It's just know. kind of silly. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, now this is when Luffy targets him with his final move, which is this is kind of how a lot of the action scenes go. You get that big final move like Zoro's Onigiri. And so this is when we get introduced to the Gum Gum Bazooka, where he basically takes both of his hands and strikes at the same time with this immense amount of power and just sends Buggy flying off. So in the aftermath, we get a nice little tender moment from Nami, a rare tender moment where she offers to fix his hat. Um, and she even gives him the grand line map in return for him helping her to carry the treasure. So not Mm -hmm. completely selfless, but you know, um, and she's decided she's going to stick around. She's still not agreeing to join their crew, but she feels like they're profitable. So she's going to at least stick around for the time being, but they get interrupted because the villagers actually show up because the villagers decided the mayor's been gone for a while. You see that the townspeople really care about the mayor and their town. So they go after him to see what's going on. And I thought this scene's very funny because they see that the mayor is unconscious and they start questioning Luffy and Nami, like, what's going on? You know? And Nami's kind of like, don't tell them we're pirates, <laughs> whatever you do. And then Luffy's just like, we're pirates. <laughs> And uh, so the villagers immediately turn on them and Nami or Luffy has to carry Zoro and they, they run off with the treasure. And, and there is a funny moment where they, they turn down an alley and Chow Chow comes back and Chow Chow is guarding the alley and holds off the villagers and lets them escape. Um, but at the very end, before they get a chance to set sail, the mayor wakes up and When he finds out that they ran off, he desperately runs after them. And we get this nice moment where as they're departing, the mayor is yelling after him, you know, his thanks and saying he's never going to forget about them. And I think this this is cool because we saw this in Romance Dawn in the first arc that Luffy kind of feels like, hey, we're pirates. We're not supposed to be the good guys. So, like, it's appropriate that we get run off the island when we're done um but he still you know waves back and is happy about it and it it says a lot about his character and what they're up to that they're not like these absolute good guys i think this is part of the change from the idea of them being peace mains is that they're not just like these superheroes going around beating up the bad guys like they're they're operating in a way that's they're looking out for their own interests you know but in the process they are helping people. 
and they are winning people over in a way that is very selfless. That's not really like they're not trying to impress anyone. They're just doing their own thing. Yeah, they're very uh, go with the flow kind of people. Yeah. And you can see where a lot of their morals came from with Luffy and his early experiences with Shanks. You can see even though he was mad in the moment that they didn't fight back, it it made an impact on him. And it definitely affected how he grew up and the kind of morals that he has. Yeah, like there's more strength in like holding your tongue and just taking taking whatever's coming at you than to fight it and to be upset with whoever's doing it. Because they're yeah. probably hurting themselves and projecting and blah, blah, blah. But, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. And that's, you know, that's a big part of why I like One Piece so much is it has these complex morals and their whole system of morality in the series. And there's a lot of depth to the characters and their motivations and everything. Like there's a lot going on under the surface. So they're, even though the, the show is really lighthearted and fun and really just, like I said, watching it, it made me feel like a kid. It was very relaxing and fun, but there's a lot going on under the surface. So it, it really is something that can appeal to such a huge audience. Yeah, I think the way that Oda shows nuance between people, like with the mob coming after and they're being angry. They're angry mm. at him because Luffy beat him up. But yeah. And the so fact he's a that, pirate. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you hear those things out loud you're like what why would you do that but mm -hmm. i mean he was protecting him so. yeah and it's the fact that luffy doesn't he doesn't try to like defend himself no or i explain love that. things he's just like yeah they should be pissed we're pirates you I, know that's I how pirates are supposed to be that level of like self-awareness that you're just like no we're gonna come here and we're probably gonna fuck shit up so they should be mad yeah so So, uh, overall, what? how did you feel about this arc? I will say this is probably a distracting point, but I, I really just don't like clowns. Well, yeah. So this was a hard watch <laughs> yeah. for me. Um, but coming off of that, I, I mean, of course, I'm just excited to see more. Yeah, and I think yeah. at this point... It's still, we're, we're in the setup phase. Luffy hasn't really been challenged. Like, I think even during his fight with Buggy, I don't know how you felt, but for me, it, it never felt like he was ever in any danger oh, or no. anything. No, know? I think it's pretty clear from the beginning how strong he is and then also yeah. how much people underestimate him. Yeah, and it's interesting because at this point, we don't really have a full grasp of just how strong Luffy is. Because everyone he's running into is kind of a pushover. Um, so we still have yet to see like him reach his breaking point, you know, where he's really getting pushed. Um, but one thing that I actually I wanted to do, it's this is going to be a little awkward because it's so early. But I thought that if you could rank these arcs compared to one another, this can you turn want into. You to rank them? Oh, yeah. Okay. It'll. I think this will get more interesting as we go. But for now, how would you rank this arc versus Romance Dawn? Like, which one do you think is better? I. I would. I think I would have to say I like this arc more yeah. than the last arc. There is like there's a bigger villain. There we get two flashbacks that flesh things out. There's Chow Chow. There's Chow Chow. Can't forget Chow Chow. Little human voice. <laughs> and yeah, we get the iconic scene of him getting the straw hat and everything. Mm -hmm. So, well, I love hearing about Shanks. Yeah. I, Shanks. Shanks, I think that's true in a lot of the community. Shanks yeah, is a I, kind of fan I favorite. I already love Shanks. He's so. a cool, he's a cool character. Yeah. So, one thing that stood out to me is when, um, with Shanks, when Luffy gets. Um, kidnapped, I think Shanks kind of freaks out and they're kind of like, God, you're such a spaz. You know, it's <laughs> like he's he's their leader and he's the feared red haired Shanks. But the way he's still like kind of goofy, I mean, you can see how uh, Luffy is like very similar kind of oh, character. Definitely. I mean, are we explained in any point right now? I'm trying to figure out what is Shanks relationship to Luffy? Do we know? 
right well, now? Well, all we know is, like I said, Luffy, he grew up in this Fuchsia village, the windmill village, mm-hmm. and Shanks and his crew were kind of staying there, and they were not hurting anybody, so they had no problem, like, feeding them and taking care of them. And Luffy, I think he's just excited, you know, as a, like, small-town boy. yeah. The, the idea of like the freedom of being out there in the ocean as a pirate. So he looks up to Shanks and aspires to be like him. So I think it's just that, you know, um, it's the idea of like, I guess the cool uncle coming around. See, that's kind of what I was trying to get at is like, yeah. you know, the cool older brother or you yeah. know something like that. Uh, I guess they're not related i don't know why i'm trying to dig in this so bad no i don't think there's any like relation i think why i'm so interested by it is because the idea that you live in this town and then just people show up and everybody interacts like you know how they used to do yeah you don't really do that and you don't really humans don't really do that well these zoomers are sitting around (laughs) tiktok all day you know (laughs) if they get their heads out of their phones (laughs) Um, so yeah, I guess that about wraps it up. Do you want to plug the socials? Oh, we're a straw hat social club everywhere. So YouTube, Tumblr, um, Instagram, TikTok. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how much we're going to have on all those platforms. Probably Instagram is going to have the most stuff right now. It, it'll probably more so be Instagram and trying to figure out what we're going to do for TikTok. If anything, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. I mean, just look us up and you can email us at strawhatsocialclub at gmail.com. If you have anything you want to say, if you want to rank us on iTunes or whatever, I guess those are the things people oh, yeah. do that I guess we out. need to start saying that too. Sure. Hey, yeah. So, you know, subscribe. Like, like and subscribe. <laughs> Smash that like button. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. That was, that was a good episode. Um so that was Orange Town. Um, for the next arc, we're going to be covering Syrup Village. We did get a little tease at the very end. Do you remember the? There's like a character you see very briefly. I don't know Ooh. if I remember. Well, I'll just say that uh, it's funny because it's there's no context. It's just a random character pops up, but it's because he's a bit of a fan favorite. And I think they were teasing it for the next arc. So maybe we're going to get introduced to a new crew member. Ooh, I'm going in completely Ooh. clear because I, my memory is so bad. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, so the next arc is called Syrup Village, covers episodes 9 through 18 of the anime and chapters 22 through 41 of the manga. So catch us on the next episode. It's going to be a long episode. Isn't it? It's a lot. Yeah. Um, they're getting longer, but... Yeah. Yeah, so I'm Todd. I'm Becca. And uh, join us next time on Straw Hat Social Club.